We're going to cover a topic now that for a lot of students at first gives them a lot of confusion, but it's just um, some very basic overview of the anatomy of the heart, including the chambers and the valves and some of the vessels, although not all of them, that um, connect to the heart. So there are four chambers or um, openings in the heart where blood flows into and, and then uh, moves through a chamber. And those chambers are individually called the atria and the ventricles. Uh, atria is plural. Atrium is singular. Ventricle is singular. Ventricles is plural. So let's take a look at these four different chambers. And let me just take this heart here, which has been opened up, and I'm going to draw a line kind of down the middle of it here. And anatomically, this side, remember, is right. Remember, we always refer to everything in anatomical position. So this is the right side. This is the left side. And on each side of the heart, there is one atrium and one ventricle. The atrium is always superior to the ventricle. So right here, we would have the right atrium. And over here, we would have the left atrium. And alongside these atria, there are little outpouchings. Uh, and unfortunately, this picture doesn't show them, but they would be kind of little outpouchings out here of the atrium called an auricle. Auricle means ear, and it does look a little bit like a, uh, an ear flap. Uh, you'll see if you do dissection in lab, you'll be able to see the auricles associated with the atria in the heart. And uh, dividing the two atria, one from the other, is something called the inter, that means between, atrial septum. So this is, septum is like a wall. So interatrial septum literally means the wall between the two atria. And in this picture, again, it's difficult to see because of the three-dimensional structure of the heart, but there is a wall between uh, this chamber here and this chamber over here. That's the interatrial septum. In that interatrial septum actually is a hole uh, that has been filled with scar tissue. And that hole that has been filled with scar tissue is called the fossa ovalis. And that fossa ovalis is a remnant from embryonic development. During embryonic development, Obviously, the baby is, or the embryo, the fetus is suspended in embryonic fluid, and so it's not going to be doing any breathing of air, and as a result, the lungs are not functioning yet. So uh, the, the whole purpose of the right side of the heart is to pump blood to the lungs to get oxygen and then return them back on the left side of the heart. Well, if the lungs aren't functioning, then gee, there's really no reason to go to all the effort of circulating the blood into the lungs when the, when the fetus is still in the embryonic fluid. And so this hole that attaches the left and the right atrium allows for blood to come into the right atrium, completely bypass the pulmonary circuit, and enter over onto the left side of the heart. Uh, the reason being, again, the lungs are not functional and all the oxygen that the embryo needs is, uh, or the fetus needs is being provided by the placenta via the mother. After birth, that hole um, between the two sides of the uh, atria closes up and the remaining scar tissue sort of depression in that area is called the fossa ovalis. The immediately inferior to the two atria are the two ventricles. And the ventricles are here and here. And of course, you have the right ventricle and the left ventricle. And let me get all this stuff out of here. The right and left uh, ventricles are separated one from the other by a wall or septum, just like we saw with the right and left side. That septum is located right here. And that septum is called, conveniently, the interventricular septum. Inter means between. Ventricular refers to ventricles. So this is the wall or the septum between the two ventricles. Now, the 
So let's take a look at what separates each atrium from each ventricle. Again, here's my right side of the heart. Anatomically, there's the left side of the heart. On the right side, there is a flap of tissue, connective tissue, called the atrioventricular valve. And as the name implies, this is a valve or flap that, that um, separates the atrium from the ventricle. On the right side, we call this valve the tricuspid valve because it has three cusps or three flaps to it. It's also called the right atrioventricular valve or right AV valve for short. You do need to know both of these names because you'll encounter different medical professionals and one may call it the tricuspid valve, the other will call it the right AV valve. You need to know that those two people are referring to the exact same structure. On the left side, here's the same uh, valve separating the atrium from the ventricle. Uh, because it only has two cusps to it, we call it the bicuspid valve. Uh, it's also called the mitral valve, and that's because if you look at the hat a bishop wears, um, it's the, that bishop's hat is called a miter hat, and uh, people thought that the the bicuspid valve looked a little bit like a bishop's mitre or a bishop's cap, so they called it the mitral valve. And then, of course, you can also call it the left AV valve. Uh, so it has three alternate names, and you need to know all three again because different people will refer to it by a different name. You need to know all three. All right, let me get this out of the way here, and let's look a little bit here at uh, some of the structures that are connected to the valve. We're going to look at the cordy tendinii and the papillary muscles. So the cordy tendinii are these little string-like structures that you can see here that attach the valve to inferiorly to the myocytes, to the muscle tissue of the heart. And they do that via these finger-like projections that I'm drawing little squares around here called the papillary muscles. And together the two of these uh, they perform a very critical function, which is they prevent a condition called prolapse. Prolapse occurs when, uh, during contraction, when the ventricles are contracting and um, blood is getting pushed, blood can either go one of two ways. It can go out this way or it can go back where it came from, up into the atrium. We do not want it to go up here into the atrium. Instead, we want it to continue flowing uh, out of the ventricle in the same direction uh, as it entered so that we keep movement of blood going in one direction only. If when the ventricle here contracts, if we didn't have some way to ensure that this valve here remains tightly closed, then blood would get squirted back up into the atrium, which would be counterproductive. So to prevent that, we have these cordy tendinii and papillary muscles. And what they do is they hold that valve tightly shut and flat like this during ventricular contraction. If they were not there, if we didn't have the cordy tendinier, if we didn't have the papillary muscles, we'd start to get this bulging backwards, like I'm uh, showing here in this dotted black line. That's called prolapse. And that it obviously impacts the efficiency of the heart, and it can produce lots of different physical symptoms like fatigue and uh, others. In addition to the uh, right and left atrioventricular valves, there are two other sets of valves. These are called the semilunar valves. The semilunar valves uh, separate each ventricle from the attached blood vessels. So if we look on the right side here, here is something called the pulmonary trunk. And this is the attaching blood vessel that leads from the right side of the heart to the lungs, there is a valve you can see right here that separates the ventricle from that pulmonary trunk. That is called the right semilunar valve. It also has another name, of course. It's sometimes called the pulmonary valve, or some places we'll call it the pulmonic valve, which means the same thing. The left counterpart of that valve is barely visible right here. 
take a look if you don't believe me take a look in your book at the picture up close and you'll see that there is a tiny little bit of a valve right there uh, you're just getting a sneak peek of it because it's actually located behind the pulmonary valve so it's a little hard to see in this picture but that one is the left semilunar valve and it's also called the aortic valve because it's what separates the left ventricle from the aorta. Now things can happen to heart efficiency if one or more of these valves are not functioning properly. A common way in which valves can stop functioning properly is they become stenotic or they develop stenosis is another way of saying that. And stenosis means narrowing. And what's happening is that the opening, the valvular opening uh, that the valves create when they open up becomes narrower. And this means that it's harder for the heart to force blood through it. We all know that it's more difficult to force fluid through a small opening, and it's more, uh, it's easier to force fluid through a large opening. So when all, at all possible, we want to have a large opening for the blood to, uh, to move through. Uh, if that opening narrows or becomes stenotic, then the heart has to work that much harder to get the blood to move through that area. How can we get stenosis or this narrowing of the passageway to occur? Well, principal way is if the valves, that connective tissue in the valves gets scarred up or becomes stiff because of damage, that means the valves will not open and close as readily because they've lost some flexibility. And so they don't open quite as wide because they're very stiff or they have lots of scar tissue on them, and that produces stenosis. And a common condition that can cause this narrowing is rheumatic fever. Rheumatic fever occurs if a person is infected um, with a type of streptococcus bacterium. And it, it, it's an offshoot of the streptococcal infection wherein the person's own immune system um, begins manufacturing antibodies that attack not only the bacterium, but they also begin to attack uh, the valves. Uh, and as a result of that, particularly the AV valves, by the way, this produces this uh, inflammation of the valves and then they become scarred and then the opening narrows. We have stenosis and now the heart has to work harder. Another common valvular disorder is something called incompetent valve. An incompetent valve is one which does not seal tightly shut. And because it does not seal tightly shut, blood will leak backwards into the atria where it should not go. Uh, you can hear this with a stethoscope in a person. You'll hear it as what's called a heart murmur. Another common condition, and I mentioned this briefly before, um, is the condition of prolapse or this bulging backwards of the valve. Uh, it's more common on the left side of the heart than the right side of the heart because the left side of the heart contractor, contracts with greater uh, strength. And so that mitral valve is put under greater uh, pressure uh, than is the right side. So the prolapse that occurs with the mitral valve is called mitral valve prolapse. Mitral valve prolapse is a condition that uh, is most frequently seen in young women. Uh, usually it's not a dangerous condition. Um, at, for most women that, that develop it, it's, they're usually in their childbearing years, so between ages 20 and, and about 40 years old. And mitral valve prolapse can produce a variety of symptoms in those women. Sometimes they just have shortness of breath or uh, they get tired really easy if they exercise, they'll get fatigued. In, in more extreme cases, they may even experience chest pain. Now, there are different types of sounds that we can hear with a stethoscope that can be indicative of different types of valvular disorders. As I said before, uh, a heart murmur, murmur indicates that I've got blood leaking backwards. Uh, which is basically I'm producing turbulence. So instead of all the blood moving in the direction it should be, I've got counter currents moving against each other. That's turbulence, and we hear that as a murmur. An incompetent valve, one that doesn't close all the way 
tightly may also produce kind of a swishing sound. Uh, a, a stenotic or stiff valve will produce almost a whistling kind of a sound. So there are some different types of blood vessels that lead to and from the heart. I want to look at these by first taking the right side of the heart and seeing what attaches to it in terms of blood vessels. And then on the next slide, we'll move on to the left side. On the right side of the heart, we have um, a couple of blood vessels that connect directly to the right atrium. There's the right atrium. And we have connected to it the superior and the inferior vena cava. Vena cava is singular. Vena cavi, if we add an E on the end there, is plural. So superior and inferior vena cavi. These guys dump their blood directly into the atrium. They are collecting that blood from all over the body. Principally, the inferior vena cava is collecting blood from arms, legs, abdomen, etc. The superior vena cava is principally collecting blood from places like the shoulders, the neck, the head, and they're all returning it into the right atrium. The right atrium then connects to the right ventricle, and then from there, blood moves outward into something called the pulmonary trunk. The pulmonary trunk, as the name implies, leads to the pulmonary circuit or to the lungs. And once we get uh, past the pulmonary trunk, it divides. It divides into right and left pulmonary veins. I want to be really uh, deliberate here in, uh, oh, I'm sorry, gee whiz, no wonder. That's not right. Should be pulmonary arteries. Okay, and this is very deliberate here. Um, typically, most people think of arteries as connecting, as um, conveying or conducting oxygenated blood. But it, when we look at the right side of the heart, this is all blood that's returning from the body. We've already gone out, we've delivered the oxygen, we've picked up carbon dioxide, now we're returning to the heart so we can go to the lungs and get more oxygen and dump off the carbon dioxide. So the blood that's moving into the pulmonary trunk and then into these right and left pulmonary arteries is actually deoxygenated. We haven't gone back to the lungs yet to get oxygen. So this is an interesting situation wherein you have arteries carrying deoxygenated blood. And while that might seem odd to you at first, it won't if I tell you the proper definition of an artery. The proper definition of an artery is it's a blood vessel that carries blood away from the heart. If we have a blood vessel that carries blood to the heart, it doesn't matter whether that blood is, has oxygen or not. If the blood vessel is carrying that blood to the heart, it is a vein by definition. If it's carrying blood away from the heart, it's an artery. If it's carrying blood to, it's a vein. And you do not use whether or not the blood is oxygenated or not to identify a, a vein or an artery. You identify it based on whether it's moving to or from the heart. Now on the left side of the heart, we have this huge uh, thing here called the aorta. Right? You all know about the aorta. That's the principal blood vessel that leads from the left ventricle and distributes blood throughout the body. Now, how did we get blood to the left side of the heart in the first place? Well, we did that through these things called the pulmonary veins. So from the, the pulmonary arteries, we went out to the pulmonary uh, or to the pulmonary circuit or to the lungs picked up oxygen, and then we return back to the heart on the left side via the pulmonary veins. And these pulmonary veins are carrying blood that has oxygen in it. Now, again, remember these pulmonary veins, since they are moving blood to the heart, we call them a vein. We do not call them an artery. And they dump into the left atrium. And... In that left atrium, we then move the blood down into the left ventricle, and from the left ventricle, we pump it out into the largest 
um, artery in the body, which is called the aorta. Now, there are several branches that come off the aorta, and I want to talk about those real quick here, if I can just get some of this stuff erased off of here. The um, aorta has three principal extensions off of it, and these extensions include these three guys here, and they are in order the brachiocephalic trunk, and the brachiocephalic trunk feeds the right side of um, the head, shoulder, and right arm. Then we have next up the left common carotid artery. This eventually leads off to the uh, head region on the left side, and then we have the left subclavian artery, that's that third one there. This leads to uh, places like the, the left side of the trunk, the left leg, etc. I'm sorry, not the left leg, the uh, left arm, etc. And then after that point, you'll see that the aorta dips downward and it goes behind the heart here and it becomes what's called the descending aorta. That's where it goes off to places like the stomach, the small intestines, the legs, the pelvic region etc. One other structure I want to mention really quickly here is the ductus arteriosus. This is a connection that occurs between the pulmonary arteries and the aorta. And the reason uh, that the ductus arteriosus develops in the first place is again happens during fetal development and it disappears at the time of birth. Again, the idea here is, hey, if I'm a fetus and I'm surrounded in embryonic fluid, my lungs are not functional yet. There's no reason for me to pump blood out through the pulmonary arteries to the lungs. Um, the lungs aren't functional, so let's instead just funnel that blood from the pulmonary arteries directly into the aorta. Uh, at birth, that uh, opening seals up, is covered over with connective tissue, with scar tissue, and the depression or the scar tissue that's left after it seals over is called the ductus, ductus arteriosus. Uh, one other thing I want to make sure you remember is the difference between the pulmonary and the systemic circuits because I'm using those terms a good bit now. Remember, pulmonary circuit means um, the, the, the circuit that connects the right side of the heart to the lungs and then returns the blood over to the left side of the heart. The systemic circuit connects the left side of the heart uh, with the aorta. The aorta then distributes blood throughout the body and returns it back to the right side of the heart. That's a systemic circuit. Okay. What about the heart muscle itself? The heart itself is a oxygen demanding organ. It uses a ton of oxygen and uh, because it's always contracting. And it cannot just get blood, or I mean oxygen, from blood that's just passing through the valves, right? If, if that were the case, then all of the heart tissue on the right side of the heart would never get any oxygen because all of the blood that enters in on the right side of the heart is deoxygenated. So there are a set of arteries that's, whose specific and only job is to provide the heart muscle itself with oxygen, and these are called the coronary arteries. And the coronary arteries stem off the base of the aorta. So here's the aorta right here. And there are two locations here where coronary arteries diverge off the aorta and then directly begin funneling blood out to vessels all along the surface of the heart. And then they, they, they uh, delve down deep into the heart tissue to get that oxygen to all of the mus muscle cells. They are the left and the right coronary artery. If we take a look in cross-section right here in the aorta, you can see that here's the aorta in cross-section, and immediately next to it are the openings that lead to the left and right coronary arteries. The left coronary artery uh, divides out into two major branches. One is called the anterior interventricular branch, and this branch leads down the front of the heart, or the uh, uh, 
anterior surface of the heart kind of it follows down the interventricular septum, which is why we call it the anterior interventricular branch. There's another branch called the circumflex branch. And the circumflex branch is a branch uh, that circumvents or circles around, if you will, the heart to the backside. On the right coronary artery, we have the posterior interventricular branch. And the posterior interventricular branch wraps around the backside and then runs along the interventricular septum on the posterior side of the heart. And then the marginal branch runs right along the edge of the heart, kind of uh, halfway between the anterior and posterior sides. It's a little hard to draw this on this particular picture. Hopefully in lab you'll get a better sense of the differentiation between those two. Okay, I've only got two more slides on this lecture, and uh, then we will be moving on to, to talking about some heart diseases. One of the critical features of um, all of the capillary beds that stem off the coronary arteries is that they've got to have multiple means of develop of, um, or multiple pathways of getting oxygenated blood to the heart tissue. Having collateral or, or alternate routes uh, are called anastomoses. Okay, so these collateral or alternate routes are anastomoses. The idea behind these is if I have more than one way to deliver blood to a particular region of the heart muscle, then if one of the routes gets blocked, such as what happens in coronary artery disease, then we still have alternate routes of getting the blood to that particular region. So imagine if this is my arterial side here, here's my venule side here, um, and here's my capillary bed between the two. If I've got oxygenated blood delivered out to the tissue here that I'm representing with X's, uh, let's say that this uh, region right here is where I'm trying to get blood to, and I develop a blockage right here. Well, obviously I'm not going to be able to get blood to that region, but anastomosis or an alternate or a collateral pathway right here that allows me to still get oxygen to that tissue. It's really important for preventing myocardial infarctions, which is another name for death of the heart tissue due to a heart attack. Now, if we have coronary arteries to deliver oxygenated blood throughout the heart muscle itself, we've got to have some way of returning that blood once we've delivered oxygen uh, back to the heart so that we can uh, get it out to the pulmonary circuit and get more oxygen. And we do that via what are called the coronary veins. And the coronary veins are shown nicely in this picture down here. Uh, they include things like the middle cardiac vein here, uh, the small cardiac vein, a very large region on the posterior surface of the heart called the coronary sinus, and on the anterior part of the heart running down the interventricular septum, uh, we have what's called the great cardiac vein. And these all collect up deoxygenated blood from the heart tissue itself and return it back to the right atrium.